Okay, some examples of potential. Um, we do something called usage and attitude studies in market research. So, for example, if we take a category like uh, motorcycles, we would uh, identify people who use, uh, you know, samples of 1,000, 2,000 people who use different kinds of motorcycles. We would ask them, how do you buy the motorcycle? Why did you buy this brand? What do you use it for? How many kilometers do you drive in a day? Do you normally have a pillion? Do you use it as a daily commute? Do you also use it for vegetable shopping? Right? How fast do you tend to drive? How often do you go for servicing? So on and so forth. And then why do you have a motorcycle and not a scooter? Why do you have a motorcycle and not a car? Right? Why do you have a pillion? Are you the main user or multiple users of the vehicle? So on and so forth. We get, we get whatever possible we can think of surrounding usage of the motorcycle. So these are called usage and attitude studies. And most companies do this once in two, three years, two, three years for the respective categories. Because it doesn't change more often than that. Now these normally lend themselves very well to segmentation analysis. Um, so, for example, we did a study which involved segmentation of consumers um, who buy timeshares. Okay, timeshare is a product category. Uh, you pay a few lakhs in advance, and for the next 15 or 20 or 25 years, depending on which configuration you buy, you're allowed to take a holiday at one of the resorts that the company owns. And the holiday, the stay is free. You just have to pay for the food and uh, so on and so forth. So essentially, it is a, some kind of hedge against inflation in terms of price of stay. That's the logic behind buying a timeshare. Plus, you know, there are people who buy it because it compulsorily makes them take a holiday. Having spent that much money, they will necessarily take a holiday, so on and so forth. So we did a consumer segmentation study to understand what are the motivational segments for buying timeshare. Now, here there are two statistical techniques that come in very, very useful. There is something called cluster analysis. There is also something called discriminant analysis. Cluster analysis basically groups people based on similarity. It says these three people seem to be more similar to each other than to that fourth person. So these three form one group. The fourth person is a different group and he seems to be more similar to some two other people or some five other people. So it, 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 it gives you a solution of sometimes two clusters, sometimes four clusters, sometimes eight clusters. Depending on the technique you use, you can also say, give me a solution of two clusters or five clusters or eight clusters. Now, the five or eight people may not be exactly similar on all parameters. They are just more similar to each other than they are to the others, the people within a cluster. And then use something called discriminant. And discriminant analysis will tell you to what extent you have successfully predicted that this person belongs to this cluster. Okay, it is a way of predicting. Uh, it, is, it is known as a classification technique. It will tell you whether you are able to correctly say if I know the gender of a person, if I know the age of the person, if I know the income level, and if I know how often the person holidays, can I predict what motivation segment he belongs to? So that is what discriminant analysis will help you to do. So these two techniques were used, and the timeshare business, essentially uh, people who buy a timeshare, and we found that there are eight motivational segments. Right? Um, I remember a few of those now because about five to six years ago. There were people who believed that they were very patriarchal in their attitude, right? I am the head of the family. I must provide the best for my wife and my children. And Mahindra holiday seems to be a wonderful experience, so I'm going to provide that, which is a patriarchal sentiment. Then there are people who are like, listen, I really need to bond with my family. I think time spent together is great for the family. So there were people who said, a timeshare will ensure that we have a holiday, and holiday is a great way to bond, so let me buy a timeshare. So they are the people who are bonding seekers. I mean, these names are just easy to understand, right? But the, the underlying dimensions are these. Then there are people who are keep up with the Joneses. He has a timeshare. He is only DGM, I am GM. I should also have a timeshare, right? So there are people who just do it out of a status consciousness. There are people who want to show off. There are people who say, you know, last week we were in the Maldives, you know, which is used our club mind a timeshare, right? So there are people who are show offs. So that is another motivational statement. Then there are people who are romantic. So there are people who say, every now and then husband and wife want to take off together, leaving the children with somebody else. So there are people who are romantic experience seekers. There are people who are new experience seekers, so on and so forth. So these are motivational segments. And so cluster analysis and discriminant analysis helped us to identify what kind of segments exist in the motivational, uh, from a motivation point of view for people who buy timeshare. Now, it's, it's not just nice to know what do we do with it? Once you've identified different segments, 
you then target communication to those people right saying you harp upon that emotional value but for that you have got to know what segment he belongs to so you got have a very simple way to say uh but this person has come to talk to me seems to belong to this segment so let me highlight this benefit in my pitch to him in your mass communication is easy you will have five or six creatives and each creative talks about the respective uh, benefit to the respective segment but when a when a direct interaction you need a simple tool to say this guy probably belongs here so let me tailor my pitch accordingly depending on what i think is looking for so that's how you put to use this the segmentation analysis so segmentation analysis um, works best when you've got a situation like people who read times of india are the ones who drive maruti cars tend to wear blue shirts and blue pants to office and slip on shoes now we can find something like this and people who read the hindu other people who wear brown shirts and brown pants to office and wear laced up shoes so, but you will never find something so perfect in real life it simply doesn't work that way you will find some people who wear brown shirts who read times of india some people who wear blue shirts who read the hindu but by and large is there a trend towards this way or that way that's what segmentation analysis is all about now once you identify the segment we can then say i want to talk particularly to this segment because one the benefit i am offering matches the benefit they are looking for in terms of motivation two the segments seems to be sizable in terms of the number of people who are present there three i can think of a media strategy that specifically targets that segment of people and so on concurrent okay. analysis have you heard of concurrent analysis not yet okay let me put it this way let's say i want to get married or 20 years ago when i was thinking of getting married i wanted somebody i'm very clear about what i'm looking for right i'm a simple guy i need a somebody who cooks like one famous person called meenakshi amal who writes cooking recipes for vegetarian food uh, in tamil magazines i want somebody who sings like ms subalakshmi or atish lata mangeshkar because i like music i want somebody who looks like wahida rahman that's about it that's all i'm looking for in life now if i find such a person who has all these three qualities if and that's a big if in life i don't think wahida rahman sings i don't think lata mangeshkar looks gorgeous so if i do find such a person who manages all these qualities then the question would be why would she marry me right so what do we do i trade off i necessarily trade off i have to say of these three things i cannot have all of them so let me have let me compromise on one or two of this so concurrent analysis what it does is it tries to find out what parameters how the trade off works in consumers minds so if you are buying a if you are buying a car we want the car to seat six people we want the car to have a pick up of 0 to 60 in 5 seconds we want the car to give a mileage of 30 km per liter we want we want the car to be parked in the smallest possible space in the city roads and we want the car to be pricing only about 4 or 5 lakhs so we have to compromise we have to trade off so what conjoint analysis does is it will show you some 20 30 50 options right i mean there's a i mean there are, if there, there are five parameters and six levels it actually has five power six possible combinations it will reduce those in 20 or 30 manageable combinations and then it will tell you in consumers minds that mileage seems to have this much usefulness utility is a term it uses and whereas uh, power has this much utility therefore the optimum combination seems to be the following three or four combinations now this technique is truly practically useful to decide product configuration service level configuration so in a banking service for example you can configure interest versus risk versus return for example you can actually work out this combination using this technique um and we have used it several times when it comes to categories like cars we have used it for coffee vending machines we have used it for tractors we have used it for uh, credit card features in credit cards you know 20 30 features in credit cards you got to narrow down to the combination that works best in the market because providing all those features will make it too expensive for us to market it profitably or for the for our client to market it profitably so you got to reduce it to a manageable and, and not just that conjoint works better to help you choose between a red car and a blue car you know where there's no inherent value ordering but a car which provides a mileage of 30 is inherently more valuable than a car which provides a mileage of 28 so conjoint is you know particularly useful to choose between options 
which have no inherent value ordering in them. I've only talked about multiple discriminant. It normally goes hand in hand with uh, in, in segmentation analysis uh, cluster followed by discriminant. But we can also use it. Uh, in fact, Sarah has done a study for us uh, some years ago. We had a problem with uh, you know a product which is being sold on EMI, and there were some customers who tend to default on the EMI. So the client wanted to predict what kind of customers are the ones who are likely to default on the EMI. So he had given us as much as possible data about all these customers. Some customers are regular payers, some are defaulters. So the uh, uh, in regression you will call it dependent variable. In, in uh, discriminant we call it the criterion variable. The criterion variable in this case had two levels: regular payers, not uh, defaulters, and your uh, Predictor variables could be the person's income level, could be the person's age, could be the person's family situation, could be the person's credit track record, could be the product configuration the person has bought. So all this went into a mix. And eventually, we were able to say, this, this kind of customer is rather more likely to default than the other kinds of customers. You're very, very unlikely to say, this customer will default. It never works so perfectly it's more likely. How much more likely is what is important. So if this kind of customer is 3% likely to default and the other kind of customer is 2.5% likely to default, that's not very useful. That's not really a actionable prediction. Or if we say people who are 37 years old are likely to default, whereas people who are 38 years old are not likely to default, that is also not very actionable because the guy who's 37 today will become 38 in a year's time. So what happens then? So you need to have significant differences in terms of the behavior prediction and actionable differences in terms of the profile that you're predicting. So if, for example, you find that um, people of Kerala origin settled in Tamil Nadu running a small market research company are the defaulters, you don't give them a credit card. I mean, you find a fantastic correlation like that. I'm talking about myself, right? So uh, if you find some such thing, Something so dramatic and something so measurable. Because you can say, where are you from? We can say, what is your occupation? Those things are measurable. And if and we find that such people, 80% of them tend to default, then you've got a formula which reduces your default uh, percentage. Right? Um, you can also do this for, you know, you have got, uh, you're running a chain of hair salons, for example. And all hair salons have a big problem with pilferage. Pilferage by employees of the uh, consumables. It could be the shampoos, it could be the coloring agents, so on and so forth. So if, if they find, and you know, uh, I, know, I know that the hair salon uh, chain found that if they start the salon at 7, 7.15 p.m., which is a normal traditional hair cutting kind of places used to start at, the pilferage levels goes up significantly compared to if they start the salon at 8.39 a.m. A.m., sorry, not p.m. in both cases. Which is why you find most of the branded salons starting the work at 8, 8.30, and the work shifts also being planned accordingly. They found that pilferage actually drops. Now, why does it drop? It could be because of alertness, it could be because the manager, the store manager or the branch manager turns up late to the saloon, is not able to keep an eye on what is happening. It could be because there's not enough consumer traffic then, so people have idle time. Or it could be the cleaning people are still floating around, they're doing something. That's, that's another story. I'm, I'm not allowed to go into that. But those are the kind of real-life applications of how you put to use these uh, techniques. Okay, regression is extremely common, extremely useful. You know, extremely common, I'll qualify later, but it is the more common of the techniques. Uh, we are talking to a client right now to figure out uh, the extent to which his advertising expenditure actually impacts his brand share movements, vis-a-vis -vis his below-the-line activities in terms of promotions and offers to dealers and so on and so forth. Um, in my very first job, I had an exposure to something, one of the most interesting studies I have ever done, um, Holix brand, the agency was JWT, called Hindustan Thompson, HTA those days. They gave five years market share data, so five years in the 12 months, 60 points of data, and they also gave us 60 points of something called share of voice. Share of voices, uh, out of the total advertising uh, expenditure or total advertising uh, viewership data of Holix and Boost and Bone Vita. What is that? What is the share of Holix type? So Holix said 8% share of voice this month, 
and 6% share of market this month and so on and so forth. They gave us that data and they asked us to build a regression model uh, between this. So the share of voice is based on the TRP data. Now, uh, why our segregation background is also because the initial correlation that we did proved that the more Holly advertisers, the lower is the brand share is. Okay, so do you go back and tell them, keep don't advertise? Our client is an ad agency, mind you. So that's something we cannot afford to do. So then we tried a lag model. We said advertise in January, what's the share in February? Right? No linear model gave us any real correlation beyond 0.1. So eventually we tried a log linear model and suddenly we got 0.8. Now 0.8 is, is too good to be true. It's, it's, a, it's a dream world where you know 80% of your market share movements are explained by your advertising. So eventually we had to go back and say that the best explanation of advertising to market share movements is about 0.2 to 0.3 kind of correlation coefficient. And that is something which has remained in my mind all along. Um, very often we talk about brand managers seeming to think, you know, the way to grow is to advertise more, is to spend more money. It doesn't really pay off, but it doesn't always pay off at least. Uh, particularly in this era, when, you know, if you're watching a cricket telecast, for example, in every break, the same ad appears. A cricket telecast, even if it is a 2020 game, lasts for three hours. The break happens every over. You actually got 40 breaks. Who can stand to see the same ad 30 or 40 times? The fundamental principles of advertising fatigue are forgotten when you know marketers uh, do this. So again, if you if you had just done this analysis of how much of the market share is explained by advertising versus sales activity versus de dealer uh, offers, they would have probably found that they don't need to spend so much on advertising. There are more useful ways to spend that money. Again, I'm not saying don't advertise. I'm saying you have got to do the analysis and then interpret what it means.